I've had an extraordinary week because I decided I changed my mind about this quite early on uh, and I've virtually rewritten the whole lecture um, in the last week. Um, but it's so enjoyable, this subject. I mean, you must be loving it. I hope you are. I am. Um, OK, so let's... Um, if you remember, this is the fifth week of lectures, so we've done four weeks of looking at various theories of causation. Uh, and we've considered three types of reductive analysis. Um, so we've looked at the regularity theory, which comes from Hume. So he thinks causation is lawful regularity. Um, we've looked at the counterfactual theory, which comes from David Lewis. He thinks causation is counterfactual dependency of some kind. We saw that um, there are a few accounts of counterfactual dependency that won't do, um, but we saw one that maybe will do. Uh, and we've looked at singularist theories where causation is uh, a set of, perhaps, or a physical process. Um, we haven't considered uh, primitivism, um, the idea that causation is so fundamental and central to our thinking that we can't reduce it. So it's like truth, it's, it is just sui generis, um, one thing in itself. Um, and nor have we considered eliminativism, um, the idea that causation doesn't exist more than briefly. Um, we'll look at that very briefly today, but I think somebody said to me um, last week that she thought this might be the case. Well. Um, we'll, we'll have a look at others who think this. Um, so this week we're going to be looking at the relation between causal asymmetry and temporal asymmetry. So we're no longer looking at a theory of causation. We're looking at theories of how the causal asymmetry is aligned with the not temporal asymmetry. Yeah. <laughs> oh God, I've probably done that the whole way through. Because <laughs> of course the, the spell check doesn't pick that up. <laughs> No, not casual. <laughs> causal. Causal. Whenever you read casual, you, you should read it as causal. Um, OK, so the folk concept of causation. And do you remember last week I distinguished the folk concept and the scientific concept and said that any account of the scientific concept is only going to be interesting from our point of view if it arguably is or can be seen to be the folk concept because what we're interested in is causation as we use it in our everyday lives. So the folk concept of causation seems to be asymmetric. Um, causes come before their effects. If C causes E, E does not cause C. Um, they're asymmetric. And this asymmetry seems to align with the direction of time. Um, the fact that time itself seems to have a direction from past to future. Um, it doesn't go from future to past. Um, so it's interesting to ask how these two asymmetries um, are related. I mean, the fact that they align so well um, makes it look as if they might be related. Um, well, Hume has theories about this or views on this, or rather he... His views aren't very interesting on this. Um, he thinks causation itself is symmetrical. Um, so he thinks if A and B are constantly conjoined, um, then A is constantly conjoined with B and B is constantly conjoined to A. Of course, has to be. That's, so the relation of constant conjunction is a symmetrical relation. And Hume thinks that causation is constant conjunction. Therefore, Hume thinks the relation of causation is a symmetrical relation. Um, so he thinks there's no more to the causal arrow, to the fact that there appears to be an asymmetry of causation, um, than the semantic convention that causes come before their effects. So cause is just defined in such a way that causes come before their effects. And effect is just defined in such a way that effects come after their causes. Um, this is surely not very interesting. Um, I mean, one problem is uh, lots of people have thought that simultaneous causation and backwards causation are possible. Um, but according to Hume, or on Hume's story, all these people are conceptually confused. 
Um, so anyone who, who thinks that time travel really might be possible is conceptually confused. It couldn't be. Um, anyone who thinks uh, that there are tachyons, uh, particles that move faster than the speed of life, light, are conceptually confused. <coughs> so they're, they're, the objection to them is not just that they're wrong empirically, but that they've got their concepts mixed up. Um, same with precognition. And any suggestion that a cause could come at the same time as its effect or after its effect um, is, is confused on Hume's story. And that's got to be a problem for Hume's story because there are, it seems perfectly reasonable to consider the possibility of simultaneous and backwards causation, even if we don't seem to see it very often or indeed at all. So the second problem um, is that it doesn't explain the fact that uh, a fact of our practical reason, um, which is that we see the past as fixed and the future open. So when we deliberate um, to achieve goals, so we want to achieve some goal or other, um, we deliberate about future goals. We don't deliberate about past goals because we can't change the past. So if we're thinking about what we can do, um, it's about how to change the future. Uh, and again, a Hume can't explain this. He just says, well, if you think you can do anything else, you're conceptually confused. And surely we might think there's a bit more to it than that. There is a sense, we think, don't we, in which the past really is fixed and the future really is open. Well, Hume can't explain that. Um, so Hume's um, account of the alignment of the temporal asymmetry and the causal asymmetry is unsatisfactory, to say the least. Um, and what we should like is an account of causal asymmetry that ensures the possibility, at least in principle, of simultaneous causation and backwards causation um, and explains our deliberative practices um, pr preferably in terms of some objective asymmetry that ensures that the past is fixed and the future is open. <coughs> and David Lewis attempts to offer such an account, the same chap as gave us the counterfactual theories. OK, any questions about Hume's and the problems with it? No, it's pretty straightforward, I think. OK, so let's have a look at David Lewis's. Here he is. Um, Lewis thinks that causal asymmetry depends upon the asymmetry of counterfactual dependence. Well, that won't surprise you. Uh, and that the asymmetry of counterfactual dependence depends on the asymmetry of overdetermination. Eh? What's that? OK, so to evaluate this claim, um, and to relate it to our hope of understanding the relation between the temporal as asymmetry and the causal asymmetry, um, we need to ask several questions. And here are the questions that we're going to be ask answering in this lecture. So first of all, you'll want to know, I assume, what the asymmetry of over-determination is. Okay. Secondly, you'll want to know how the asymmetry of counterfactual dependence depends on the asymmetry of overdetermination. If if Lewis is using this asymmetry to explain that asymmetry, we've got to know how um, they're related. Um, thirdly, does the appeal to asymmetry of overdetermination explain the relation between the causal arrow and the temporal arrow? Because that's what we want to know. Um, so those two are, are things that we've got to know in order to know this, but we, that's the important thing. Uh, and I've already said that we've got two uh, desiderata of um, uh, an account of the alignment of the asymmetries. Um, does Lewis's account give us the first one, i.e. does it permit the possibility in principle of backwards and simultaneous causation? And you can imagine what the second one is. Does Lewis's account, Lewis's account explain our deliberative practices? And lastly, of course, is Lewis's account correct? Um, can, are there any objections we can bring to it? Um, or should we just reject it? And with it, the explanation of the alignment between causal asymmetry and temporal asymmetry. Okay, 
Anyone think of any other questions? I hope not. But if you can, we'll think of them afterwards. So what I'm going to do for the rest of this lecture is try and answer these questions. So let's start with the asymmetry of overdetermination. What is the asymmetry of overdetermination? Lewis says that in this world, though not in every world, so we're talking about something contingent here, we're not talking about something necessary. In this world, it's typically the case, in other words, it can happen in this world that it's not like this, um, but typically it is like this, um, that there are many more future determinants of events than past determinants of events. I should have put of events in there. OK, so Lewis thinks that um, there's an asymmetry of overdetermination because it's typically the case in this world that events have many more future determinants than past determinants. And a determinant is a set of minimal conditions such that they're sufficient for the event. OK, we'll, we'll say something more about that in a minute. OK, so let's have a look at an example. Um, we say that the campers lighting his campfire started the forest fire because we believe that had the camper not lit his campfire, there would not have been a forest fire. OK, does that make sense? We think the nearest no campfire possible world to this world is the world in which the forest didn't burn down. OK, so if you remember, we evaluate counterfactuals by saying... Uh, in the world where the antecedent is true, uh, sorry, is there a world in which the antecedent and the consequent are true? Is that world, a, a world like that, nearer than any world in which the, consequent, the antecedent is true and the consequent false? So looking at um, had the camper, um, where is it? Had the camper not lit his campfire, there would not have been a forest fire. We're looking for whether there's a world in which the camper did light his campfire sorry, didn't light his campfire and there wasn't a forest fire, is that nearer than any world where he did light his campfire and there was a forest fire? Have I got that right? Who's on the ball here? Hang on, let me... Just in case I've confused you. Um, the cam Had the camper not lit his fire, there would not have been a forest fire. OK, so we're looking, which is nearer? Camper didn't light fire and no fire, or Camper didn't light fire and fire anyway? You with me? OK, so that's only true if that world is nearer than that world. Yep. OK, sorry to confuse you there. So we think the nearest no campfire possible world to this world is one in which the forest didn't burn down. We don't believe it's a world where there was another condition sufficient to burn the forest down. Um, Overdetermination over of future events by past events, it does happen in this world. So if you're facing a firing squad, you may end up with two bullets in your heart. Uh, so if the first bullet hadn't killed you, the second would have done. And your death is overdetermined. It undoubtedly happens in this world, but it doesn't happen very often. It would be very bad luck in this world once we discover there's a link between the camper lighting the campfire and the forest fire. It would be very unlucky if the camper hadn't lit his fire and lightning were to strike and the fire start anyway. Um, it's not usually the case in this world that uh, the past overdetermines the future. But now consider that the forest fire happened a year ago. 
there have been many traces of the forest fire and in principle scientists, forensic scientists, will be able to discover where and how it started. Um, so there'll be many conditions a year after the fire um, that could only have come about because the fire started when and how it did. And that's what forensic science is all about. Um, and what we're seeing when we see that is that there are many future determinants of the fire. There are many conditions, uh, sets of minimal conditions, such that they are sufficient for the fire having started when and how it did. Okay, so there's an asymmetry of past to future here. So typically, there's only one minimal set of conditions such that, given the laws of nature as they are, they were sufficient for the forest fire starting when and how it did. But again, typically, there are many sets of minimal conditions such that, given the laws of nature being as they are again, they are sufficient for the forest, forest fires having started, having started, I should say, when and how it did. The future, says Lewis, typically over-determines the past, but the past does not typically over-determine the future. And this is the asymmetry of over-determination. OK, anyone want to ask any questions about that before I go on? Bob? Uh, starting, in other words, there was only one minimal set of conditions before the fire yeah. that was sufficient for the fire, but there are many sets of minimal conditions after the fire for the fire. And it's those conditions that science, that lead science to n say that that's where the fire started. Okay. Um, OK, can you imagine a forensic scientist saying, ah, if this were not the case, if, uh, sorry, given that this is the case and that this is the case, it must be the case that the fire started here. But those conditions are there before, it's all after. Those conditions are there after the fire. Oh, yeah. It's the fire that caused those conditions, yeah. but those conditions are sufficient for the fire having started then. Yeah, OK, so, so, um, so there's one, this is typically the case, a condition sufficient for the fire starting, and many, again typically, conditions sufficient for the fire's having started, whoops, I should say then and there. That's, that's the difference, that's the asymmetry. So if the camper hadn't lit his fire, the, fire, the forest would not have burnt down. There's one sufficient condition. I, I should think that you will accept that happily. Okay. What you're having trouble with, I assume, is this one. Um, the idea that there are many conditions in the future sufficient for the fires having started. Okay, but again, think about forensic science and think about the fact that a forensic scientist would be able to go into that forest and identify conditions that would only be there if the fire had started then and there. In other words, they, looking backwards, they determine that that's why the fire started. But are you using the word sufficient in exactly yep, the same way? Yep, in exactly the same way. So what do you mean by sufficient? Uh, sufficient evidence, can I say that? I mean, will that make it easier for you? So if I say uh, this condition was sufficient, OK, that's got to be causal, I suppose. It's, it's causally sufficient for the fire having started. Um, and here, 
I can use causally again, because if you're thinking, uh, and we are thinking, and maybe I should have said this before, um, that the laws of nature are deterministic in each direction. So the reason a forensic scientist can look at a crime scene, forget the fire for a minute, the reason a forensic scientist can look at a crime scene and say, this is the sort of weapon that you're looking for, this is the sort of uh, height of the person who wielded the weapon. Um, the person who wielded the weapon is, is probably right-handed. Um, the reason that the forensic scientists can say that is because that, that there are lots of things about the crime scene that make it the case that this is what must have happened. Probability. Well, you, you can write in probability if you like. Um, even if you add the words probability, that's, that's not a problem. I think my problem is the other way around. I, I, I'm worried about the over-determinism of the cause of the fire. Because as I see it, if the campus fire... There isn't any over-determination of the cause of the fire. There's only one cause of the fire, and that's the camper having lit his... But there could, there could be... There could be others. Yep, you're absolutely right. Because there could be a lightning strike. There yeah, be absolutely. We're, so we look back and we see that um, the fire did start that way. But of course, it could have started. It could have been that had the camper not lit his campfire, okay. the lightning would have struck. Yes, but in this case, that's not true, is what you're saying. Well, and nor is it true often in this world, is it? Um, so if the fire brigade tells us that the fire in the house started because there was a short circuit here, we tend to think that that was the only sufficient condition for the fire that was around at the time. And of course, we might be wrong. Later on, the fire brigade might come to us and say, oh, hang on, we've also just discovered this oily rag <laughs> or petrol covered rag. Um, so maybe it was that. And now we seem to have two potentially sufficient conditions for the fire. Uh, and this is going to throw up, the, you know, this is really ir irritating but because it's that's very uncommon. Yeah, but that doesn't, does that count as over-determination? That would count as, if there's more than one condition sufficient for starting something, for causing something, that's over-determination. Mm. So Sorry, you're saying there's still an asymmetry? So I'm, I'm so, yes, uh, that's why the word typically is so important. Um, sometimes there's over-determination from past to future, but typically in this world there isn't over-determination from past to future. There's only one sufficient condition for an effect. Um, but when it comes to the forensic scientists checking out why it started, there are lots of things that lead back to the fire, to the uh, campfire. There was one. No, no, you, uh, looking the other way, it's the many factors that tell you there was one. But if you went equal distances in time before and after, I think you could have an equal number of determinants going in each direction. So if you go a year back, that Bob with the fire has to not go down with a dread disease. Yes, I, I see what you're saying. OK. Um, I did say, but I didn't make a lot of, the uh, fact that it has to be a minimal set of sufficient conditions. Um, there's, uh, so, have I said it here? Okay, there's only one minimal set of conditions such that, given the laws of nature, the campfire was a necessary part of that minimal set of sufficient conditions. The forest fire or the campfire? With the campfire, you would be able to um, have a very <coughs> minimal set of conditions looking backwards as well. Do, do, do um, you say there's an asymmetry in time? You'll be looking over the same period of time. Okay, so this is, is this what you're saying? I'm not entirely sure. I know Here's the campfire. 
And you're saying there are many things that lead to that, just as there are many things that lead away. And the further away in time you go into the more you have. The more you have to take into consideration. Yep, OK. Um, and we're saying that this is the cause, because had this not occurred, the forest fire would not have occurred. So I want the word necessary in there somewhere, don't I? Because it's the necess necessity of this one um, that's important because it's, the f it's everything looks back at this one, not at the others, um, just before the fire. Um, so typically there's only one minimal set of conditions such that given the laws of nature... They were sufficient for the forest fires starting, and the campfire was uh, was a necessary part of those. I think you're quite right that that needs to be in there. Can we also say, um, but what happened in, or will have happened in the future, is a necessary condition of the sufficiency of the condition, of the one condition in the past that brought about <laughs> the fire? Um, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. I spent a long time on the weekend. Uh, sorry, I'm, I'm looking at that one. Um, the person I behind I you. I probably have a simpler question. Good. Who is the person who introduced explanation in order to distinguish between cause uh, and effect? Yes, I have already introduced explanation. Yes. So why yep. isn't he using explanation instead of one minimum set of conditions? How does minimum set of conditions differ from explanation? Um, uh, uh, Think of it like this. Uh, the campfire, as you said, has many different causes and many different effects. But we explain it. We t do you remember when I talked about we, we only what the difference explanation is, is we talk about the cause. In other words, it's the one that makes it intelligible to us. Um, well, because when we identify that condition, the forest fire makes sense to us. So I, I could just as easily say, had the camper not been born, the forest fire would not have started. And that's true, because the, the camper's birth was a necessary condition of the fire starting. But it doesn't give us a, an, an explanation, does it? It's, it doesn't make the fire intelligible to us. Whereas if I pick out this cause, the campfire, it's an explanation because it does make the fire intelligible. I take it that that's what I just said. So, so there are lots of different causes, most of which wouldn't be cited in an explanation. The only causes that can be cited in an explanation are the ones that make intelligible to us the effect. And those are the minimum set of conditions? Uh, no, there, are, there can be, uh, I mean, there are lots of, of conditions necessary for the minimal set of sufficient conditions, but some of them won't be cited in explanations. OK, I'm going to move on. Um, you could add, a, add another cause. I mean, it's not just the fire. The wind in the right direction. Well, uh, do you remember, it's always the case that, that any one event has many things that contribute to the cause. Um, but <coughs> if we're wanting to explain it we'll, pick it, we'll say, had the camper not lit the campfire, the fire would not have started. It's also true that had the wind not been in the right direction, the fire would not have started. Um, and we might use that as an explanation. Um, if we're particularly interested in why the fire went that way instead of that way, or, or whatever. So what we pick out as the explanation tends to be relevant to our interest in an explanation, what it is we want. If we want, only want to know whether it's why it started, the campfire is the one. If we want to know the direction it went in, probably the winds direction would be. 
but I want I just want to go back because I'd hate to lose you at this point. So let's just um Okay, Lewis says that the asymmetry of overdetermination is the result of it's typically being the case that events have more future determinants. There are more things in the future that determine that this fire started with a campfire that will tell us, if you like, that this thing started with a campfire than there are things in the past um, that ensure that the forest fire started. Goodness, I think I'm getting myself confused here. Um, so we say that the campers lighting his campfire started the forest fire. And we say that because we believe that had the camper not lit his campfire, there would not have been a forest fire. Um, and that's because of the possible worlds. Um, so we ask which is nearer, where the camper didn't light the fire, his campfire and there was no forest fire, or the one where he didn't light his campfire and there was a fire anyway. Um, if that world's close, closer, then the forest fire is over-determined, which mi it might be. Similar, more similar to. I, and I'll be looking at that in a minute. OK, so we think that the nearest no campfire possible world to this one is the one where the, world, the forest didn't burn down. If the camper hadn't lit his fire, the forest would not have burned down. Um, we don't believe there was another condition similar. If we know that had the campfire not... Sorry, I can't put it that way. Um, if we see that there's a link between the camper lighting his fire and the forest fire, we tend to discount the possibility that there was another condition that was sufficient, although there might have been. Um, and so, although overdetermination of, over of future events by past events does happen, so do you remember you might be shot and you have two bullets in your heart. If one hadn't killed you, the other would have done. And if the, campfire, if the camper hadn't lit his campfire, the lightning would have struck and the forest burned down anyway. Might be true, but it's not true very often in this world. There tends to be one thing that we'll pick out as the minimally sufficient condition for the starting of a fire. Uh, and then I wanted you to... OK, so that, I think, should be fairly straightforward. But now I'm asking you to consider that it happened a year ago. Um, and I'm so pointing to the truth that there are going to be many traces of the forest fire at this point, and scientists are, in principle, able to follow those back to identify the cause of the fire, the thing we're picking out as the cause of the fire. Uh, so there are many conditions that could only have come about because the fire started when and how it did. And what that is, says Lewis, is it shows us that there are many future determinants of the fire. If we're looking backwards, there are many ways of telling it, uh, that it was the fire. If we're looking forwards, uh, the forest fire started because of the campfire. OK, so that's um, the asymmetry of over-determination. And I, I hope that there'll be a bit of time left at the end of the session um, for those who, who would still like to ask about this. But let's go on to look at how the asymmetry of counterfactual dependence depends on the asymmetry of over-determination. Ah, my throat is not going to hold out, I think. Um, so, Lewis says that when we evaluate counterfactuals, we rely on determining the overall similarity. So, this will answer the question that you wanted to ask just then. The overall similarity to the actual world of various possible worlds. And in determining this, we've got two things that we've got to consider. Firstly, we've got to consider the laws of nature of that world and how like the laws of nature of this world they are. And secondly, we've got to consider particular matters of fact at that world and how similar they are to the particular matters of fact at this world. So you might have world, worlds where the particular matters, well, 
where the laws of nature are very different from our world. I mean, perhaps these are worlds where um, things, water looks like this and tastes like this and behaves like this, but is X, Y, Z. Um, so they're not our world, our, our laws. They're very different from our laws. Um, and there are other worlds where I'm male, let's say. Actually, whether that is a possible world is a different, difficult question. So, OK, so we've got to determine the we've got to look at the both these two things uh, and the counterfactual is going to be true or false, depending on how we weigh these two things with each other. Um, and I'm going to illustrate this claim to you by um, bringing to Lewis's claim an objection called the future similarity objection. Um, that I think you might find interesting as well. Okay, if Nick Nixon had pressed the button, there would have been a nuclear holocaust. Okay, who believes that? If Nixon had pressed the button, there would have been a nuclear holocaust. Anyone not believe it? Why? Too much politics to explain. <laughs> right, OK. Um, but we, we sort of think that in this world, things were such in the Cold War that everything was set up in such a way that if either side had actually pressed the bloody button, <laughs> we would have been in trouble. <laughs> OK. Um, so usually we'd consider that to be true. We'll just ignore Mike and anyone else who thinks that maybe not. OK. Um, but surely, says Kit Fine, who brought this objection originally, any world in which a nuclear holocaust didn't happen should be nearer, taken as nearer to our world, more similar to, closer to our world, than any world in which a nuclear holocaust did happen. And you can see why he says that. You know, a world in which a nuclear holocaust... I mean, given that this is a world in which there, well, there was, so far, no nuclear... I'm touching wood no nuclear holocaust, um, any world, any other world in which there wasn't a nuclear holocaust is going to be more like this world than any world in which there was a nuclear holocaust. Um, so surely this is a problem for Lewis's um, account of counterfactuals. Oops, I didn't realise that was going to... Do you see why that is a problem for Lewis's account of counterfactuals? Lewis says that what we look for is the world closest to our own. And what we're thinking here is in the world in which Nixon did press the button, which is not our world, of course, because in our world, thankfully, he didn't press the button. But in the world in which he did press the button, there would have been a nuclear holocaust. Now, intuitively, we think that that's true. Um, but what Kit Fine is saying is it's actually not true if what we're looking for is the world that's more similar to ours. So this is a black mark for Lewis's theory. Let me go on to how uh, Lewis responds to this, and that might help you understand if you haven't understood uh, the problem here. Um, so Lewis responds by taking us through the procedure of identifying possible worlds and judging their relative similarity to ours. And there are two things we've got to note before considering this rebuttal of this objection. And this is the one that I should have said earlier, perhaps. For ease of exposition, Lewis considers the laws of nature to be everywhere and always deterministic. Um, he explicitly says, and I put the reference in the notes for all these things, by the way, he explicitly says that this isn't necessary for his claim, but it does just make it a lot easier. Um, to think about. Um, and he's going to talk about miracles in a minute. Um, so you need to know what a miracle is. And what a miracle is, is a violation in our laws of nature. But importantly, it expresses a relation between this world and another world. So if we're thinking about um, a world in which Nixon did press the button, OK, there's a violation of our laws. There must be, because in this world he didn't press the button. Um, but it's not a violation of the, world, of the laws in that world. How could it be? 
there can't be violations of the laws of nature. So the laws of nature of this other world, the world where he didn't press the button, are not the same as ours. They may be like ours, but they're not the same as ours. They couldn't be. Again, let me continue. OK, so we survey the possible worlds. So we're looking for the nearest world where Nixon did press the button. Sorry, you're going to have to put up with my stopping for... The nearest world where Nixon did press the button. Well, there are worlds that we discount as being so dissimilar to ours, we're, they're not even candidates. So the world where Nixon presses the button and there's this great spray of confetti comes out or the missiles go off and shower Moscow and Leningrad and so on with, with confetti. OK, the confetti worlds are not worlds that are similar to ours. There are such worlds, but they're not ones that are going to be counted for the purpose of this. And another world in which doesn't count is the world in which Nixon presses a button, but where the laws are identical to our own. In other words, where particular matters of fact are so completely different to our own um, that the laws uh, determine that he presses the button. Um, so that's what uh, Lewis says is that either laws are similar to our own or they're not. Sorry, either worlds are similar to our own or they're not. And this world just clearly isn't. We don't take any account of this world. So let's have a look at the worlds that we do count. Um, firstly, we're going to look at worlds of type one. And there are lots of worlds here, not just one world. Um, so there are worlds that are just like ours until a tiny miracle, so a tiny change in the laws of nature, <coughs> causes just enough divergence from our world for Nixon to press the button. And so what Lewis says, perhaps a couple of extra neurons fire in his brain or something like that. But anyway, you know, there he is. He's sitting there thinking about pressing the button. In our world, he doesn't press it. But in this world, he does. God, maybe it's an accident. <laughs> um, but once he's pressed the button, worlds of type one evolve in accordance with their own laws. And we know that these laws are very like ours because... Up until the point of pressing the button, the worlds have been identical. All we've got is a tiny miracle. So they're a perfect match with respect to matters of fact up until the divergence miracle. And they're an almost match with respect to the laws. We only had a tiny divergent miracle uh, in order to get Nixon pressing the button. Um, but the future of these worlds radically diverges from our own there's a nuclear holocaust. Um, so, and this is why Fine thinks they can't be like our own. But what Lewis is arguing is that they can be even though they're so unalike. So let's look at type two worlds. So these are worlds, again, just like ours until there's a tiny divergence miracle which causes Nixon to press the button. But then there's a convergence miracle um, so he presses the button, but there's no nuclear holocaust, OK? Um, so they're a perfect match with respect to the past uh, until the divergence miracle, which causes Nixon to press the button. Uh, and although the holocaust didn't happen, it's because there was a little convergence miracle, a little miracle that brought the world <laughs> back um, so there wasn't a holocaust. And 10 years, uh, uh, Lewis says, 10 years after this convergence miracle, this world is going to be very different from our own. And that's because Nixon pressed the button and the Holocaust didn't happen. So Nixon's huh, wiping the sweat from his brow. He's having a large gin. He's, um, he's writing his memoirs. He gets the Nobel Peace Prize. He, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And each of these little divergences of matters of fact adds up to a big divergence 10 years later. Um, so again, that world is like ours. So 
so it's like ours up to the first miracle. Nixon presses the button. Here's another miracle. And there's no Holocaust. And you might think that this world is more like ours than the other. So world one, uh, it's like ours until there's a first miracle. And then Nixon presses the button. And then there's a Holocaust. So this is not like ours. And this is like ours, but increasingly divergent. And then we've got type three worlds, which are again, just like ours, till there's a tiny divergent mi miracle, which causes him to press the button. But then there's a convergence miracle that doesn't just um, prevent the Holocaust happening, but it also wipes out all traces of Nixon having pressed the button. OK, so here we've got just like ours, and then there's a small divergence miracle. Nixon presses the button, and then there's another miracle. But whereas this miracle just wiped out um, his pressing the button and left everything else the same. This wipes out every trace of button pressing. So he doesn't need a large gin. He doesn't write his memoirs. Uh, he doesn't, you know, the light waves that would have gone from the button um, don't go. Everything goes back to how it was. So we've got this world like ours until Nixon presses the button and then there's a holocaust. Not like ours at all after that. This one, like ours till Nixon presses the button and then although there's a no holocaust, there have been a lot of little changes which will become bigger changes later on. And then this world, which is like ours till Nixon presses the button and then because of another miracle, exactly like ours from then on. Okay. Um, Lewis says that these worlds, OK, uh, what I've just said, these are a perfect match with respect to matters of fact until the divergence miracle. And then they're a perfect match again because the convergence miracle wipes out all traces. But the miracle required here, says Lewis, is huge. It's huge and it's diverse and it's complex. And that's because there are so many traces of Nixon pressing the button that have to be wiped out um, that you, you can't just call that a small miracle. You can't just change a couple of neurons and have that uh, do what you want. So the laws of nature in this world are very different from our own. And the need to postulate huge miracles means that these worlds are further from our world than the worlds in which we don't need to postulate a huge conversion miracle. So here, these worlds, which is the outcome we wanted, we think that it's true that had Nixon not pressed the button, there would have been a Holocaust. What we've got to rule out is these two sets of worlds. But Lewis thinks it's quite easy to rule out these sets of worlds as being more similar to our own than this one, because actually, if everything had been up till then as it was, and you don't introduce any more miracles but that tiny little divergence miracle, you'd get the Holocaust. You wouldn't get the no Holocaust world. Surely a type 3 world, uh, in retrospect, is our world, because we wouldn't know the difference. Uh, <laughs> I'd rather not introduce epistemological problems here. We're looking at, from a metaphysical point of view here. You're absolutely right. The only person who would know the difference. Well, actually, even Nixon wouldn't know the difference. Because it's wiped out his memory. Yeah, because it's wiped out his memory, exactly. So nobody would know the difference here. But, but this, is a, this is a metaphysical thought experiment. It's not epistemological. You're absolutely right that, that epistemologically we couldn't tell the difference. Where David? Would have been against the laws of nature if Nixon had the Why what? Sorry? Why would 
if he had pressed the button. Well, remember that we're thinking of the laws as deterministic. So in this world, the laws determined him not to press the button. Therefore, if he did press the button, there must have been a different set of laws um, and or different matters of fact. So that's based on the idea that there was a thing determined. Yep. Yep. All these experiments are based on the, on the thought that um, they're determined into the future and indeed from the future into the past. OK, do you see why this is a rebuttal of the future similarities objection? Why we would choose that world as being... So even a world in which a Holocaust had happened is going to be more similar to our world than, than these other worlds because you've got to change the laws of nature just too much um, to get those other worlds as being similar to our own. And as Chris quite helpfully pointed out, this is not an epistemological thought experiment, it's a metaphysical one. We've, we've got to adopt a God's eye view of this. We can't look at how, what we would have thought if we had been there. Um, OK, so according to Lewis, there's an asymmetry of the miracles needed to change the past and those needed to change the future. So the fall, small divergent miracles, those that change the future, need only change a few neurons in Nixon's brain. But the huge convergent miracles, those that wipe out, uh, those that change the past, have got to wipe out the many diverse and widespread changes um, of the uh, traces of Nixon's pressing the button. So not just Nixon's neurons, neur Nixon's brain, but also his, the sweat on his finger has got to gather up from the button and leap back to his finger and um, he stops looking at the gin bottle and, and so on. Um, and according to Lewis, this justifies our thinking that type one worlds are closer to our worlds than type two or three worlds. And that's the end of the future similarity objection. And the asymmetry of overdetermination uh, explains the asymmetry of counterfactual dependence because it generates this asymmetry of miracles. So there'll always be an asymmetry of miracles that you need to change the future and miracles you need to change the past, says Lewis. Uh, and that asymmetry of miracles... Um, generates counterfactual, the asymmetry of some counterfactual dependence because it depends on that, or maybe the other way around, I can't remember which way I'm thinking. Okay, so let's just have a look. Does this explain the relation between the causal arrow and the temporal arrow? Now, this is the place where the physicists in the audience can watch me and wonder if I get it right. So the asymmetry of overdetermination is a contingent empirical asymmetry. Um, it's contingent. Nobody is saying um, it's an. Ob oh, sorry. Okay, it's an objective feature of the world. Okay, it's not something that we're projecting onto the world. It's an objective feature of the world, and according to Lewis, explains both the arrow of time and the causal arrow, and therefore the fact that they're aligned with each other. Um, and if the he says at the end of his the piece that I I'm using relying on quite heavily here, and which of course is referenced in in your handout, if the asymmetry of overdetermination could be related to the asymmetry of entropy, uh, he says he doesn't know how to do this. Um, it would ensure that his account uh, is respectable from a physicalist point of view as well. But other people have done this. Uh, I mean, it was many years ago that he said he didn't know how to do this. Um, so the laws of fundamental physics, as we saw, I think, either last week or the time before, um, are time symmetric. Um, they run forwards, they run backwards, they're symmetrical. Um, there's no asymmetry that can come in there, except for, I mean, apparently I'm told there are a few particles that which that might not be true, which I assume are tachyons, are they? Chaons. Okay, well, uh, uh, so uh, we might think, if we think this, that time can't be asymmetric. And there are physicists who think that time can't be 
uh, asymmetric because or that time doesn't exist because of this. But there is a part of physics that does permit temporal asymmetry uh, and it's thermodyn thermodynamics. Okay, it's that branch of physics. So this is physics 101, right? For the rest of you and for me. Um, it's that branch of physics that's concerned with heat and temperature and their relation to energy and work. Uh, and there are four laws of thermodynamics and the one that concerns us, oh, okay, so all these laws express constraints on macroscopic variables. Okay, they're not the microscopic variables, but the macroscopic ones, pressure, entropy, and internal energy, um, the energy within a system. And these are common to all materials rather than just particular to particular materials. It's the second law of thermodynamics that tells us that entropy always increases, that unconstrained energy and matter will spread. So if you look at the, the picture that's rather ghostly behind this, here you've got something being contained, but when you remove the constraint, it expands into um, the area that's available to it. Um, so entropy always increases as unconstrained energy and matter will spread. Um, and entropy is the only quantity in physics, the measurement of which requires us to postulate a particular direction of time. As we go forward in time, the entropy of an unconstrained system will increase. And that's why if you don't drink your coffee quickly enough, it'll go cold. The heat will disperse. So if we, can, if we can link the asymmetry of overdetermination with the asymmetry of entropy, um, we'll have a contingent empirically and physicalistically respectable asymmetry that in underlying the temporal and causal asymmetries explains why the two asymmetries align. Um, I'm going to, sorry, I'm, uh, I'm going to say something later about whether this is possible because there are people who think that this isn't possible and there are other people who think that it is possible but only under certain conditions and I'll say something about that in a minute um, but at the moment I just want to say that this, the link between entropy and the asymmetry of overdetermination would give us just what we want as long as it solves the two problems that we looked at earlier. So let's look at the first problem. Does it permit the, permit the possibility in principle of simultaneous and backwards causation? Well, uh, it it's, is a contingent asymmetry. There's nothing necessary about it. So that allows that there are worlds, not this world maybe, but there are worlds uh, in which causation is simultaneous or backwards or both. Um, and it also allows that there might even in this world be cases of simultaneous or backwards causation. Um, so it, it is just saying this is typically the case. It's typically the case in this world and it's a contingent matter. So it, it allows it there to be in this world simultaneous and backwards causation and it allows there to be plenty of other worlds in which there's simultaneous. So it certainly meets that constraint. Um, okay, does it explain our deliberative practices? Well, it explains our common refusal to backtrack. So imagine that Joanna and Jane had a really bad quarrel yesterday. Um, Lewis has Jim and Jack, but I think that it's quite important to acknowledge that there are women in the world. So imagine that Joanna and Jane had a quarrel yesterday. You might think that if Joanna asked Jane for help today, Jane would say no. Would you usually think that that's the counterfactual that, that would tell us what would happen if Joanna asked Jane for help? But why don't we reason that if Joanna asked Jane for help today, it would be because there hadn't been a quarrel yesterday? So she'd say yes. Well, we don't reason like that. And one of the reasons we don't reason like that, according to Lewis, is because of the 
over, uh, asymmetry of overdetermination because our, our belief that we can't change the past. So it explains our reluctance to backtrack. Actually, we, we will backtrack. I mean, if, if we were talking about Joanna and Jane's quarrel um, and you suggest, well, if Joanna asked Jane for help, Jane would say no, I might jokingly say, well, actually, if Joanna asked Jane for help today, it would be because there hadn't been a quarrel. And you'd laugh, wouldn't you? But you wouldn't take it seriously because we can all imagine situations where it was true that despite the quarrel, Joanna had asked Jane for help, but they all involve situations that are so emotionally tearing or, or you know, if something had happened that meant that Joanna's child was, her life was hanging on a thread and the only person who could help would be Jane, she would ask Joanna for, Jane for help, wouldn't she? Despite the quarrel. But so none of these situations involve the quarrels not having happened. But others have asked why the fact of an asymmetry of overdetermination should lead to our determining it's not rational to act with past ends in mind. So I thought you'd like to do this little Newcomb problem. Some of you may know it, but the rest of you, okay, there are two boxes and this one is transparent. I know it doesn't look it, but it is. Um, and that's why you can see that inside it there's a thousand dollars. This one is opaque. You can't see what's inside that. Um, but luckily, I can tell you that uh, in a minute you're going to be asked to choose whether to take just one of these boxes or to take both of them. Um, and that an, an infallible predictor somebody who knew which, you were, which choice you were going to make, has put either nothing in that box, if he reckons you were going to choose both boxes, or a million dollars, if he thought you were just going to choose that box. So which, who's going to choose both boxes? Put your hand up if you're going to choose both boxes. So shall I go over that again, or is it clear? Yes, I will. OK, so you've got two boxes, one transparent. You can see there's a thousand dollars in it. One opaque, which is either empty or has a million pound, uh, dollars in it, depending on whether an, inter, uh, an infallible predictor reckoned you would choose just this box or the two boxes. And he thought, OK, so looking at um, Mike, isn't it? Um, Mike's going to choose one box. Therefore, just this box, so I'm going to put a million pounds in it. Um, but what's your name? Adrian. Adrian is going to choose both boxes, so I'm going to put nothing in here. OK. Who's going to pick both boxes? Hands up so I can see. OK. Who's going to pick just the one box? Just the opaque box? I, I'm a one boxer too. OK, so... so relatively easily, evenly divided. Um, those who would pick the, the two boxes, why would you pick the two? What's your justification for picking the two? Can anyone tell me? Well, I might get a thousand, I will get a thousand dollars and I might get more. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you're going, if you buy picking two, you get a thousand dollars, whatever happens. And if there's a million pounds in here, you're doing even better. Okay. No, no, that one's going to have a thousand dollars in it, whatever you do. So I was saying, if that one said you must pay a thousand. Uh, no, no, that's not. In this one, there's either nothing or there's a million pounds. Oh, I see. You, you're changing the experiment. Um, I'd have to think about that. <laughs> um, OK, those of you who, who say that you would only pick one, what's your reason there? OK, because you're, what you want to do is provide evidence to yourself that the infallible predictor did predict that you would pick the only one. 
uh, in which case there'll be a million pounds in it. Why the two boxes? Why didn't you go along with that? I mean, what makes you think that in picking both there might be a million pounds in there rather than nothing? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Right, well, forget you. <laughs> Are you saying the infallible predictor, uh, if he was infallible, would put a million dollars in, in the... If he thought you would pick only that box, yeah. he would have put a million pounds in that box. Right. Whereas if he thought that you'd pick both, he so would it put... if you trust the concept of an infallible predictor. Uh, yes. Because, I mean, the interesting thing about this is... There's all. <laughs> so you'd you'd have both. I don't trust the <laughs> okay. So you have both boxes. You're a two boxer. Okay. Um, the thought is here that that when you're actually making your choice, it's too late, isn't it? That whatever has happened has already happened. Um, so you should, if we're right that we never think of um, doing anything to affect the past, there's nothing we can do at this point. Um, in which case we may as well take both. That's the thinking, and that's why Lewis says he would take both. Um, but the rest of us, those of us who are one boxers, have a sneaking suspicion um, that actually by taking this box, we can make it to have been the case that the infallible predictor will have predicted that w um, we would choose that one, and so he would have put a million pounds in it. Well, anyway. The other possible explanation you might have said there, um, you haven't brought free will in. <laughs> I don't need to bring because free will into it. it. Well, if there's an infallible predictor, and <coughs> he has, or she, to pick up your point, has <coughs> made a prediction and it's infallible and has put a million pounds in there or not, then um, what I'm going to do is already be determined. Yes, and uh, that's why you would choose two boxes, presumably. Uh, so, uh, you, know, you don't lose anything by choosing two boxes. Yeah, I, I hadn't thought that through when you asked me just now why I... Yeah, <laughs> but I, I assumed that's what you were thinking, um, because that's what a two-boxer would think. <laughs> I'm assuming you're a two-boxer. So, sorry, so start again. No, I don't think they're grounded in reality at all. <laughs> yes, actually, I have wondered. I, I mean, you, the some t descriptions is of this experiment have an almost infallible predictor, um, and others have an infallible predictor. Uh, but almost infallible is probably better for the reason that you're saying. Okay. Because if it's infallible, he would have known that you would choose only that one. Yep. Okay. So, oh, sorry. I've forgotten I'd done that. So Lewis says that you should take both boxes. Um, uh, and then he believes that our rational deliberations are determined by the asymmetry of overdetermination. Um, but if we realise that the infallible predictor would have known that we would choose the single box, then those of us who would choose the one box would say it's not irrational to choose the one box. There's a good reason for doing so. So um, our rational deliberations are not guided solely by the asymmetry of overdetermination. Now, I'm happy if you ask lots of questions about that later because I'm not sure I entirely understand how, the, um, how it works here. And I'm still, I'd like to have given a lot more thought to that before doing the um, essays. So if you want to ask questions about that, we can work it out together. But um, let's go on to the sixth question, um, which is, should we accept Lewis's account? So we've looked at what Lewis's account is. So he says that uh, the reason that the causal asymmetry and the temporal symmetry are aligned is because both are determined by the asymmetry of overdetermination. Um, and that the asymmetry of overdetermination is a contingent empirical asymmetry, possibly relatable to uh, the asymmetry of entropy, which is an objective fact about the world in which we live. Um, and it's quite consistent with there being simultaneous and backwards causation. And it's uh, 
it, it explains at least some of our uh, rational um, choices. So, well, Adam Elger, uh, and all the references are again on your handouts. Where are your handouts? Are they, have you got them, Doug? Oh, no, well, wait until the end. I'll get. So Adam Elger um, thinks that reconvergence miracles needn't be large and diverse. Um, so if you remember, um, Lewis's account depends upon an asymmetry of miracles. It depends upon the idea that, that miracles that cause a divergence can be small, very small. Whereas miracles that cause a convergence must be big and diverse and widespread. Um, well, Adam Elger, in a, in a rather very interesting paper, um, argues that actually they needn't be large and diverse at all. Um, it depends upon the boundary conditions. Uh, and if the, boundary, if the boundary conditions change just slightly, um, you could actually get a reconvergence miracle that's very small uh, as well. I recommend you to read that paper if you're a physicist and really want to know what I'm talking about here, because that'll tell you what I'm talking about. Um, but Price and Westlake show that that just needs to, sh uh, shows that we need to set boundary conditions. If we relate um, the asymmetry of uh, overdetermination with the asymmetry of entropy, um, we need to say that we should only consider those possible worlds in which the boundary conditions are as we think the boundary conditions must be in this world, i.e. we started off many, many years ago at the beginning of our universe with a state of very low entropy. And this is called the past hypothesis. Um, and according to Price and Westlake, if you assume that the asymmetry of overdetermination is constrained by the past hypothesis as the um, asymmetry of entropy must be constrained by the past hypothesis if it's to deliver our experiences, um, then you get a very nice link between entropy and overdetermination. They also think, however, that unless we build in the asymmetry for a rational, of rational deliberation from the beginning, we'll never succeed in getting it. Um, they actually think that all these asymmetries are subjective. Um, that in fact, that, that fundamental physics is absolutely right. There is no asymmetry at a fundamental level in the world. Um, and the sy symmetry, sorry, the asymmetry at the macro level is entirely subjective. And there are physicists, this is for you, um, there are physicists and philosophers, and there are references on the sheet, who believe that time isn't real. And perhaps at the micro level, it isn't. Um, what does this tell us about its reality at the micro level? Perhaps these two are right to think that actually all these asymmetries are entirely the result of our perspective as rational agents on the world. Okay. Oh, sorry, there's someone else. Uh, so Matthias Frisch, Frisch believes that temporal asymmetry depends on causal asymmetry rather than the other way around. So again, you can have a look at that. I haven't considered his view at all. So we've got a quarter of an hour in which you can tell me what you think. And just to say, we've examined the alignment of the causal arrow and the temporal arrow. And next week is the last week of these lectures. And we're going to be looking at mental causation uh, and whether causation when it comes to mental states is different from causation in the physical world. Oh, I've still got a voice. Just. Bob. Uh, right, I'm going to go back to the forest fire. Mm -hmm. It's been bothering me. Um, I can see that <laughs> lighting, the, the camper lighting the fire causes the forest fire and causes loads of um, pieces of evidence to be around a year later. Yep. Which are caused by that. Those we might call the effects. 
and I can see that the forensic scientists may well be able to focus on any number of effects independently without the others and say this effect shows conclusively that the fire started when and where it did. But I don't think anybody in normal English would say that those effects were the cause. No, no nobody's saying that they're the cause. Well, I can't see, in that case, when you say they're overdetermined, well, is that the purely... Yeah, OK, okay. <laughs> well, perhaps you could say they were the... Um, I mean, why wouldn't you say it's the cause? Answer, because you think causes come before effects. No, because I think they're, it's just not the use of the word cause. We would say that they're Ooh. causes of their belief. There's absolutely no doubt cause. that you wouldn't say cause. No, you'd say that they are, they are the, what, the reason why I believe that there was a forest fire. Whereas the lighting of the fire was, was the reason why it happened, not the reason for believing it happened. So I don't think Um, and is that only because the word cause, you, you would use cause here, so, uh, sorry, I should have two things here, I'm going to run out of paper. Use posh words, I think the, the bit at the beginning is on to Hang on, let me uh, just draw things as I want to draw them. OK, um, the campfire caused, uh, is a sufficient condition of the forest fire, caused the forest fire. And the forest fire caused the traces that the um, forensic scientist is able to trace back. And what you're saying is that uh, you're happy to use the word cause here and indeed here. Yeah, um, but what you won't use is cause here. I mean, th so the traces of the fire didn't cause the fire, and you, you, you assume that that's what I'm saying. Um, bearing in mind that the laws are deterministic, um, you could say this caused it to be the case that that, but I agree, we wouldn't usually do that. But can I say that um, trace A is a necessary part of a minimal sufficient condition for there having been a fire. Yep. So I'm not using the word cause. A minimal, say it's, it's a minimal sufficient condition for there to have been a fire. Sorry, it, it's a, uh, oh, I should have put, is a necessary part of a minimal sufficient condition for there to have been a fire. No, I'm, well, it's a minimum, yes, it, it's, it's a minimal, whatever you just said, condition <laughs> for, for our believing that there was a fire. Or well, a minimal possible effect, even. It, it's, um, I mean, I'm trying to keep our beliefs out of this, if you like. I mean, I'm looking at the relation between this trace, trace A, and the fire, and I'm saying that trace A is a necessary part of a minimal sufficient condition for there having been the fire, or for there to have been the fire. So I agree that we, using the word cause here, it feels all wrong. Well, can I leave you to think about that? Because obviously you don't find that as, as worrying. Um, and you might ask yourself why. Well, I was only going to say something that might help us to understand this. That a forensic scientist <coughs> will call those the initial and secondary causes. Because you could look at it. The, the campfire causes... They would call these the initial yeah. and secondary causes. So Of the campfire? Yes, of, of the fire, not the campfire, the oh. forest fire. Because the campfire would have been the initial cause. But it might have been more local had the campfire not spread.
Greg to say containers of, I don't know, butane gas that he'd got for cooking. <laughs> so that would then have blown the thing much wider and actually caused the total forest fire. So a forensic scientist would look at them as initial or primary causes, this is where the word cause comes in, and then secondary <coughs> causes caused by the first cause but that may be caused... Yes, but, but that doesn't respond to Bob's point because he, he's happy to allow that causes can be in the past and have effects in the future, that causes in the past can have effects in the future. What he's unhappy about is what he saw as my su suggesting that there are causes in the, in the future of things in the past. And I, I hope that I've put him slightly at ease by saying that we don't have to use the word causes here. We um, it's certainly true that, that the campfire would have itself had lots of effect that, that combines to produce the forest fire. Uh, and those would be secondary causes on your... Well, yeah, because the lighting of the campfire was the primary and initial cause. Yeah. Had that not happened, none of the others would Yeah, but then several other things happened. Yeah. yeah. Yep. The campfire started, it was just a campfire, if you see what I yep, mean. Yep, yep, no, I see exactly what you mean. But something took it a stage further to create a total forest. Yeah, I mean, what your d the secondary causes are in here, aren't they? Yeah. Well, they come within the campfire, yeah. Yeah, well, the campfire caused the secondary yeah. causes, um, and, and the secondary causes combined to, to cause the forest fire. Yep. Sorry, say that again. Campfire is not necessarily causing secondary causes. In fact, by um, secondary causes, you're meaning the factors that contributed to it that were not... Oh, OK, so things like um, the butane gas being there. OK, so, so they were just... OK, there was a whole context within which the campfire led to the forest fire. I mean, that, that doesn't go against anything I've said here. I mean, we've, we've always allowed that when you strike the match, uh, the match only causes the lighting of the flame if there's oxygen around. So there's always a context within which a cause has its effect. And the traces that a forensic scientist finds also lead back to the many conditions that in the first place caused the fire. Yep. So I don't think you can say they're asymmetrical because their traces not just of the fire, but of the total conditions. Okay. So there's no asymmetry there. I well, think. if you don't think there's any asymmetry, then you will agree with Elgar, and, and you might read his paper, um, because he, he also disagrees with Lewis that there is an asymmetry of, um, of, well, that there's an asymmetry of miracles, and therefore an asymmetry of overdetermination. Chris. I'm very happy with the current <coughs> conclusion However, I'm much less happy about the suggestion that, as I understand it, the effect can occur before the cause. Backwards causation. Backwards. Well, nobody's <laughs> saying that it can. All we're doing is, is leaving the possibility open. But, but <laughs> if, if we... So... If, if, if our, uh, I've forgotten the term you use, but the man in the street believes that, that can't happen, um, then we need to take account of uh, and Lewis's count does take account of that. What, it, what he's saying is that there's typically... Uh, an, so if I go back to the slides where I'm considering that... OK. Um, so does he permit the possibility in principle of simultaneous and backwards causation? Um, all he's saying is that it's typically the case that causes come before their effects. Um, there might be cases in this world, he's not saying there are cases in this world, there might be cases of simultaneous and backwards causation in this world, and there might not. 
And there are worlds in which there are cases of simultaneous causation. There are also worlds in which there are cases of backwards causation. Right from the very beginning, it's Hume that's given us the idea that the word cause means comes before an effect. Yeah, it does. Uh, it does. Uh, well, well, no, because the, the thing is you do... It's certainly true that um, our experience tells us that causes come before effects, but that's consistent with everything that everybody's said. Um, but we do wonder about time travel. We do wonder about... Um, and in wondering about time travel, we're, we're postulating backwards causation. Um, but I might, I might like a philosophical argument that, that denies backward causation. You're saying you're not getting it from this. Oh, you can, uh, uh, all this argument is saying is that in principle, there might be worlds out there, and it might not be this one, in which there's backwards causation, in which an, an egg might um, sort of uncook itself and leap back into its shell. Um, but they're not saying it's this world. Okay. <laughs> and do, do you see, I mean, there's a very, it's a very important point here. Where, uh, what Lewis is doing, I think, is making sense of the eye of why lots of people have thought that backwards causation might be possible um, and other people have thought simultaneous causation might be possible and and he's allowed us to do that whereas Hume doesn't Hume just rules it out um, a priori David one thing that's niggling me um, with the Newton's paradox <coughs> can we assume lots of things niggle me about it go on yeah. um, is the um well, presumably he's rational as well because he's he's acting for reasons, isn't he? He's well, is he? Supposing he's just a sort of peculiar machine whose actions are determined, say, by the position of a photon after it's gone through the slit. Well, we've got to write into the thought experiment that he puts a thousand pounds. Uh, uh, sorry, a million pounds into the opaque box if he believes that you're going to choose just. So he's acting for a reason. He's put the thousand million pounds in there because he believes that you're going to choose that box only. Right. So he'll apply a sort of principle of charity to you. I, I'm not sure I'd call it a principle of charity. He, he has views on the choices that you will make in the future. He believes that, that you will choose two boxes, but you will choose only one. And on the basis of his belief that you will choose two boxes, he's going to put nothing in the second box. And on the basis of the fact that you are going to choose both boxes, no, one box, he's going to put a million pounds in there. Is he generous or is he trying to make a quick buck? <laughs> uh, he's trying to confound you all. And me. I would say if he's uh, got a million pounds to give away, he's probably quite a good predictor of future effects. <laughs> Oh, it would have to, yeah. Uh, no, it would have to be for, for one particular person, one choice. And one choice of that, that person, because, I mean, uh, Mike, having chosen one way the first time, might think, sod this, I'm going to choose the other way the next time. Is this the case of backward causation, then? No! What are you, have got in <laughs> Uh, ah, I see what you mean. I'm sorry, I shouldn't... I, by choosing the box, I am trying to influence something that... Um, you can't influence it. No, you, you can't influence it. It's already done. The choice has already been made as to whether there's a th million pounds in there or nothing. Um, but what you're trying to do is provide evidence for his having chosen yes. Um, yes, to put a million pounds in there. Doesn't your rationality then determine how he's going to yes the yep yep but he's acted i mean that's why it's a game theory problem but he's acted before you've been acted rationally so you could say that it's your but he problem. knew what you were going to choose i mean when, when you write that in you've immediately got a situation that isn't like any situation well, you're actually going to have uh well he's omniscient and rational isn't he yeah. i'm not convinced that he's not just omniscient okay 
and all of that risk on both sides. You think it's what? I'm just not convinced that it isn't a case of, all of an exercise in risk on both sides. Well, it is. You're, you're risking... I mean, if you choose one box, you're risking losing the thousand pounds. If you choose both boxes, you're risking losing a million pounds. Oh, I see. Well, we've just written that in. <laughs> well, you, yes, of course, because you're allowed to do that with a thought experiment. <laughs> um, I said there is a question of whether he's infallible or almost yes. infallible. I, I'm, well, I'm saying that I think it's, it's a, a risk assessment on either side, really. I'm not convinced. Well, I don't think... Uh, we'll have to assume that it's not his million pounds unlike your assumption that it is his million pounds. Maybe he's spending other people's money. OK, let's, let's finish there because um, people have to go off and catch buses.